What's up, everybody? We're back at it again with another squad video, except this is going to be the recap for March 2018. <laughs> It starts out with, hey squaddies, welcome to the March recap. It's been a busy month at home and abroad as some developers attended GDC and others welcomed the aerosol winners to Vancouver. We're happy to report that they kicked mocap butt. The rest of you can kick back, enjoy some squad, and enjoy the fruits of March. A special shout out to the pros at Animatrix for hosting us at their top notch motion capture facility. Our veterans have never felt sexier than when donning mocap formal. And then we move on to AAS Ticket Bleed Tweaks. We're doing a number of different changes to AAS in order to promote a more varied style of play and to positively incentivize flag capture. These include dramatically reducing the ticket bleed on the middle flags, as well as increasing the ticket win loss when an actual flag area is captured or lost. Neutral flag captures will now also include a ticket gain for your team. There will still continue to be a very heavy mercy ticket bleed on the end flags. Our intention with these changes are to increase tactical variability and creating the dynamics for a more open-ended approach to strategy. The neutral flag ticket gain should still retain the incentive to capture middle flags quickly for your team to deny the enemy team that initial ticket advantage. These changes are in the testing phase and ticket values may fluctuate and are subject to feedback from community gameplay testing sessions. Alpha 10.2 bug fixes. A number of key bugs have been identified and are addressed in the latest hot fix, including three big ones. Spawn overrun mechanic for fobs has not been working correctly since V10 release. When enemy players get within close range of the fob, the spawn times for that fob should increase. This is based on the ratio of friendly to enemy players in the radius. We shall be monitoring these changes. Expect more tweaks coming to this area, as the spawn massacres around compromised fobs is not the intended gameplay outcome. We value your feedback here and welcome more discussion on the topic of fob spawning. The next one reads, Squad kit roles are being force switched has been corrected when squad members left a squad. Kit roles were being force switched if the squad dropped below a minimum players for a kit requirement. This has been modified so that it will only force switch players upon respawn. A less pervious method to protect against players exploiting kit requirements has been implemented. An exploit that enabled players to load logistic trucks with additional supplies above 2000 limit has been fixed. Oh, <laughs> name tag and squad leader 3D HUD UI upgrades. We know name tags have been a hotly debated topic, especially when it comes to them showing up when you don't want them to. In parentheses, blocking your vision, there are many incapacitated players in the area, or when there are many players inside a vehicle, etc. We feel name tags are necessary for team squad cohesion and situational awareness. Our goal is to make them as unobtrusive as possible, while giving players the necessary fluid, contextual situational awareness. We have reduced the number of name tags shown on the 3D HUD. It will not only display only one name tag at a time, the one you are directly looking at. We have also tightened up the viewing angle for the name tag to appear. We we understand that players have a large variety of different display setups and may want to customize the UI. We have added two new slider bars in the options, one to adjust the name tag opacity and one to adjust the name tag size. There is also an on and off toggle for 3D HUD name tags. Default is on and an on and off toggle for 3D HUD kit roll icons. Default is off. And then it shows a picture of the UI and just the two little options which is actually kind of cool. The squad leader icon on the 3D HUD has now been simplified. The SL icon an important passive tool that allows for instructive cohesion and spatial awareness of a squad, especially when it comes to newer players joining in. The SL icon will now be displayed on the 3D HUD persistently, but it will fade when the SL is out of range. Map screen UI updates. The map screen will have a new feature. Players inside a vehicle will have their name tags displayed when mousing over the vehicle. The name tags of all the players inside the vehicle will be listed according to the seat position, as well as the squad hashtag and kit role of each player. Names displayed are test machines for demonstration purposes. Additionally, the map screen will also have a new indicator for vehicles showing the squad number of the driver. The new indicator will be discreetly displayed next to the vehicle's map icon. This enables squad leaders to better assess the battle situation on the map quickly and efficiently. Nice! I like it! I like it! British Forces Update The British have undergone more work and polish since we have shown them initially in January. They are, from a gameplay point of view, almost ready and will feature a unique array of small arms to make their infantry a more considerable threat on the battlefield. Improved Vehicle Damage Model
So in the video it reads, an armored vehicle will now have different armor thickness mapped realistically to its body. On the BTR-82A, the thickness armor is found on the turret, upper front and sides. The weakness armor is found on the roof and the rear, and the remaining areas are in between. One massive upgrade we're doing with the vehicle damage model is the development of a localized damage system, and the ability for us to model different armor thicknesses and angle of attack in order to determine the effectiveness of the projectile against armor. Currently, all the vehicles have a very simple health system that does not respect the location or angle of a hit, making anti-tank and vehicle play understandably low. One example is the Striker, where with the new system, its frontal armor is completely impenetrable by the 14.5mm rounds, whereas its side and rear armor are more vulnerable. Another important upgrade is to include the angle of projectile to the armor when calculating the penetrating capability. An armored vehicle will not have different armor thicknesses mapped realistically to its body. On the Striker, the thickest armor is found on the front nose section. The weakest armor is found on the rear half. For example, hitting the armor on the angles means more material thickness. The projectile must go through, which determines whether the penetration is made or not. We also plan to have the impact effects and audio reflect whether the penetration has occurred and you are actually doing damage to the armored target. This is the beginning of a deeper system that we will later expand into, damaging critical internal systems on vehicles such as engines. In addition, damage on separate components like tracks, wheels, and turrets. That sounds interesting, holy cow, it's like World of Tanks. BGM-71 Tow Guided Anti-Tank Missile Launcher As a part of upping our anti-tank defenses, we are introducing an addition of an anti-tank guided missile systems for all conventional forces. Initially, we will be implementing the BGM-71 Tow Missile Launcher for all factions, while the outwork for the 9M133 Cornet ATGM is still being done. But this should provide a very good analog for the kind of anti-tank capability FOBs will have. FOBs will be able to deploy going into the future. The tote missiles are a wire-guided missile that follows the target commands via a very long wire attached to the launcher. The player can effectively steer the missile while in flight onto a target, and it's extremely effective against stationary or slow-moving targets. Weapon Emplacement Optics Upgrade in an effort to improve our fire support capabilities of FOBs, optics have been added to emplacement Russian NSV, British and American M2 Brownings, and both emplaced and mobile versions of the SPG Copy or Copi Copy? I don't know what the hell. Both the M2 Browning and the SPG9 have completely functional reticles that allow for precise shooting at range. The intention is to make these weapons even more of a threat and further allow the fog to lock down the area. Update. Chemdish Highlands. Alright, so we see a video of a guy walking around in what looks like a training area. I believe he's wearing the uh, insurgent new uniform. As you can see, he has a, I believe that's a plaid shirt. I could be wrong, but I'm sure that, I think that's a plaid. Um, and honestly, I like that they're doing a new look for the insurgents because... The placeholder ones basically look like a bunch of old men to me, so I like the I like the new upgrade looks. We managed to pull our mappers out of the SDK for a few minutes to see what the latest updates are, are looking like on Camdesh, and they sure have done us proud. We expect fighting from building to building to be fierce, much like the terrain surrounding the point. Squaddies should be ready to practice their bounding cover tactics if they expect to survive. Look at this beautiful looking map. Oh my god, I can't wait to get my hands on it. Oh yeah. The road in is rarely the road out, but with armor thickness coming in the near future, you might survive a few seconds longer. Be on your guard for anti-tank support. Update, Cohad Expansion. As you may know, we've been taking some time to go back and fix up some of the old favorites. This time around, we're looking at the Cohad Expansion, which is building on the fantastic work the environment team has already laid down. In addition, we're opening up the playable zones. A lot of the surrounding dressing has been added to the map edges to make you really impart the sense of the large world around you. The beautiful lighting is sure to be used as an excuse for taking a few stray rounds from the enemy. <laughs> Lol. Stackup.org. Air Assault. A while back we had the opportunity to invite a few veterans from the community to join Stackup.org and the squad team for a mocap session. Our winners were in Vancouver, British Columbia over a recent weekend at the Animatric. We're just getting some of the pictures and video in, so stay tuned for the full-fledged article in the near future. In the meantime, a huge thanks to the winners and Stack Up for making a once-in-a-lifetime event possible. Bonus points for making sure it goes down in gaming history. Stay sharp out there, squaddies. April is upon us and has the reputation for being tricky. We'll see you in the next recap and on the battlefield. Did you see something you want to talk about? Something you want to see next month? Sound off to your next favorite squad leader in the community discord. Until next time squaddies. Offworld out. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming out to watch. I hope you enjoyed the video. There's a lot of information that came out here like holy cow. Um, 
I actually quite liked a lot of it. And uh, yeah, I think I will catch you in the next one. Be sure to like, favorite, and subscribe and do all that crazy shit. And I will catch you in the next one. Bye bye. So as I was talking about the event at the end there, they actually released it. So might as well, you know, do it while I'm here. Take a knee, squaddies. Back in January, we were lucky enough to partner with our friends at stackup.org for our first assault. The idea was simple. Take a couple of lucky veterans from the squad community and get them in the game. With the help of the Amatric, whom we previously visited, we've done just that. Getting all the best people into the same room pays off, and we couldn't be happier with the results. We were a bit overwhelmed by the response, and it was a tough pick. Just two winners. Squad's community is filled with some of the toughest, most humble, good-natured military professionals we've had the pleasure of meeting. William B. from the USMC jumped at the chance to show us his moves. His favorite games include Arma 3, Battlefield 4, and Squad, of course. Help him keep in touch with friends, relax a bit, and spend time with his son, who's also an avid gamer. You also might recognize him from some of other publications. When he's not playing Squad, he likes to watch Karma Cut and the Devil Dog Gamer get their streaming on. Daniel, Harry Holocraft, from the Australian Defense Force, has spent time deployed in Iraq, Timur Lest, and Afghanistan. These days, though, he prefers to spend a little more time time playing Escape from Tarkov and Squad, with a solid background in Arma 3. If he's not gaming, you might catch him checking out streams from Cowboy Chug, Deadly Slob, Desmos Luck, PCAT 101, or Russ UK. Both of these fine fellas have first-hand knowledge of the world Squad showcases, and they really brought the sort of experience that makes the game live and breathe, especially after putting the guys through the paces. If you'd like to know more about their background, be sure to check out this article on stackup.org. As you can see, we gathered a mix of animations while the guys were there. The pros really know how to move, both on the field and off. Check out this pristine tactical move. Now that we have all the awesome capture data, we can get it to the developers, animators, and artists for all the hard work that goes into making it game ready. Look for updates on the upcoming recap. It was truly an honor to be a part of the air assault. We cannot wait to work with stackup.org again. A huge thank you to the Amatric, our veterans, and the squad community for working so hard to support squad. If you'd like to get involved with stackup.org as an individual or a group, you can start here. Off world out. Okay. Now this is truly the end of the video. Um, I just want to say one more thing. Uh, tell me what you guys think of this because if you guys like this then maybe I'll do recaps of uh, Squad 2. Because you know I like playing Squad a lot too so I thought you know might as well. Oh and also you know a subscriber told me to. <laughs> uh, influence. Alright well I'll catch you in the next one. Bye bye.